Can I have your attention, please? Please stand up. <laughs> please stand up. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, we continue. <laughs> oh, the real Marcus Noble. Okay. Um, especially happy now to announce uh, the session of a good friend. So, Marcus Noble going to talk about from fragile, thanks for using this difficult word, <laughs> from fragile to resilient, validating admission policy, strengthen Kubernetes. Sounds great. And yeah, welcome, Marcus. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. As Engin said, I'm Marcus Noble, so quick introduction about me. I'm a platform engineer at Giant Swarm, currently working on release engineering and CI-CD infrastructure. Um, at this point, I've got maybe about six years or so experience running Kubernetes in production environments. Over that time, I've had a bunch of different roles. So I started off as an app developer building uh, TypeScripts, Node.js applications, deploying to Kubernetes. I was running uh, like a, a three production, uh, sorry, three clusters, dev stage in production for a single team. I then ended up building out, uh, moving into a more R&D style, building tools for the rest of the organization. And then finally moved into more platform engineering and ops for other companies and things like that. So I've, I've, I've dealt with a lot of like different aspects of Kubernetes and the different personas that work with it. So hopefully what I say kind of embodies some of that. If you want to get in touch with me anywhere, um, generally Mastodon's the best place. I'm marcus at kh.social. Or if you want to get me on any of the other platforms that I'm not as active, they're all on marcusnoble.com and find me wherever you, you like. So dynamic admission control in Kubernetes. So validating admission webhooks, mutating admission webhooks, those of you that already know me may know that I've got kind of a love-hate relationship with these APIs in Kubernetes. The uses of these APIs uh, are quite core these days to running production Kubernetes clusters. So they allow for things like defaulting of values, um, policy enforcement, so like don't use the latest image tag, always use a non-immutable image tag within your clusters, um, enforcement of best practices, uh, making sure PDBs are enabled, things like that. And also some cool um, problem mitigation solutions. So there's a nice one that I like, the log4 shell exploit from a few years ago. The way to basically turn off that code path that was exploitable was through an environment variable. You could use a mutating webhook to enable that in every single pod within your cluster to effectively make them safe from this exploit in one go. All sounds good, but while they are powerful, they do come with some level of risk. Now, this isn't the talk for today. This is actually the talk from Rejects in Chicago of last year. I gave a talk all about webhooks where I went into the ways that these can go wrong and have gone wrong, and ways that I've seen them go wrong in production clusters and had to deal with. If you're interested in that, take a look at that talk from last year. Um, ask me about it afterwards, whatever. But today, we are here to talk about something else. So while these are powerful, there is this risk. Wouldn't it be great if we had a safer alternative? Well, yes, yes, it would. And as such, we actually do, or kind of almost do. So I'd like to introduce you to validating emission policies. Um, this was introduced as an alpha in Kubernetes 126, became beta in 128, and is going to go GA in 130 that's coming out next month, month after, something like that. Like the code freeze has just happened, and I've seen that the PR's gone in. So these are going to be available for use soon. So what are they? They are a declarative in-process alternative to validating admission webhooks. Now, by that, we mean declarative in that they are defined by like, Kubernetes manifests, and they are in-process as in inside the API server. So you don't rely on an external pod running your validation code or an external service or whatever. Um, they use this thing called common expression language, which I'll refer to as cell. Um, for their policy language. We'll, we'll come on to this in a, in a short moment. And they use two main resources to define all this logic. So there is a validating emission policy, which describes the policy logic, and then a validating emission policy binding, which links the above policy to the actual resources you want it to apply to. All sounds good. So let's 
quickly take a brief pause and introduce Cell, just so we're all on the same, uh, same page. Uh, for those that don't know, Cell uh, it's this, it's this language that's used for the policies, but it's very similar uh, in the way that it does expressions to C-based languages. So if you've done any Go, Python, the syntax is relatively familiar. So here we've got an example of like self.min replicas is less than or equal to self.replicas, and and self.replicas uh, is greater than or essentially the other way around, but you know what I mean. Um, no, it's not. It max records. It's designed to be embedded inside other applications and other languages. Um, and really, it's a focus on like one-liners, so short bits of code that's not like hundreds of lines of code. Uh, it has a short number of built-in functions, so things like split, has, stuff like that. Um, and these functions can actually be expanded with your own custom macros that you can add. And in Kubernetes, they have added several additional functions through libraries that you can make use of in um, validating emission policies. You may have already seen Cell in some other cloud-native tooling. So Caverno, for example, uses it for some of their policy expressions. Tekton uses it in their Tekton triggers to define um, matching logic and stuff like that, as well as a bunch of other places you may have seen it. Um, one thing that's quite interesting about it uh, it has this concept of a cost per operation that can be calculated ahead of running the, uh, the actual function. So if your, uh, your policy expression is actually considered uh, too expensive to be run, the API server can decide not to run it and, and block that operation. So we're not um, risking potentially locking up the API server doing an infinite loop, for example, or something like that. So it's quite nice. So with that out of the way, let's have a look at how we can make use of validating emission policies today. So we're assuming now that 1.30 isn't released yet. This slide will change as soon as that's released, because it will be generally available. But until that point, as of 1.29, uh, validating emission policy is not enabled by default. You must enable, first, the validating admission policy feature gate on your API server, and also the admission registration.ks.io slash v1 beta 1 API. You need to enable both of those, and then you can start making use of this. Um, if you want to try this out in a kind cluster, you can use this little config that I've got here on the, on the right that enables these two things, and then create a new kind cluster with that config, and you can try out these um, as you like. So let's have a little look at what they uh, look like. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to walk through an example that I've got here, which is a policy that will block the use of the latest image tag uh, throughout our cluster. So we don't want anyone to use latest. We want them to always use a, a versions tag, for example. So first off, we've got the name of the policy. Um, this is what we'll refer to later in our binding. So here I've called it prevent latest image tag. Very imaginative. Um, and then we've got a failure policy. So what we want to do, uh, what we want to happen if it, if it, if it fails to, to, to run this policy. And the other alternative here is ignore. You'll want to use ignore if you want to maybe disable the policy temporarily, whatever. Um, generally, this defaults to fail, and, and that's what you'll have it as. Next, we've got a series of uh, match constraints. These then allow you to define what your policy can work against. So in this example, uh, we are defining it against deployments, daemon sets, and stateful sets. One thing to be aware of here is um, the resources you pick that your match constraint can, can, can match against kind of need to have the same spec API so that your cell query doesn't get massively long where you have to check. It, does it have spec.whatever? If not, spec.whatever. You know. So in this example, Deployments, daemon sets, stuff, they all have a very similar spec.template.containers. Uh, within the validations, we've then got a, a custom, a user provided message. This gives you a human friendly uh, error message that can be displayed to the user when using kube control or whatever. I highly recommend uh, using one of these always in your policies, because if you don't, the error that is shown is the entire expression that has failed. And it's not very friendly to the user. You just get this big blob of like cell expression. It's like not, not great. And then we get on to the actual cell expression here. Now, one thing to be aware of that still now constantly catches me out is you are defining what, is an, what an allowed resource looks like, not what you want to block. 
So in this, exam, in this scenario with the latest tag, we want to show, we want to match against things where the tag is not ending in latest, rather than the tag where it is ending in latest. Um, so just be aware of that. So what does it look like? We've got this thing called object. So this is a, a, a variable that's provided to us from Kubernetes. An object refers to whatever the resource is that we're matching against. So in our example, it will be a daemon set, a deployment, a stateful set, one of the three, um, against whatever this API request has been made against. Uh, we've then got, uh, on that object, we are looking at the spec.template.spec.containers array. And we want to say that all, which is one of the cell functions, for all of those, we want to check that the container.image does, does not end with latest or no tag at all, which then implicitly means latest. Um, and then we also want to do the same for init containers. So because, an, because init containers on our spec is an optional property, we need to first check whether that property exists on our object. So we'll use the has function here. And if it does have init containers, we then perform the same check for the latest tag on the init containers. And then obviously we may also want to do the same for ephemeral containers as well. Uh, but you know, these, things, these expressions get long pretty quickly. Once we have that, we then want to uh, work with our validating emission policy binding. So as I said, this, this binds our policy to specific resources, to API requests, things like that. Until we have a binding, our policy does nothing. It just sits there looking pretty in our cluster. It's very uh, minimalistic as to what we've actually got in here. So first up, we've got the policy name. So this is the name of the, the policy that we've just seen, so prevent latest image tag. We've then got this array of validation actions. So there's three possible options here. There's deny, which if met, you know, if not met, will prevent the API request from happening. There is warn where if met, it will still let it happen, but it will show our, our error message to the user. And there is audit, which creates a record in the audit log. Now, the reason that this validation action, actions is an array is that you can provide both warn and audit at the same time, so you can, you can have that. If you provide deny, you, you get deny and audit explicitly. You just need to provide deny. And then finally, we've got match resources. So this here is where we can use label selectors and things like that to specifically match against a certain namespace or a certain set of labels on our resources or whatever. For our example, because we want to do cluster-wide and make sure it matches against any pods or any deployment or whatever that we're creating in the cluster, this is just going to remain empty, which implicitly matches against everything. If we didn't want to match against everything, we would do something like this. So in this example, uh, I only want this to bind against, bind against labels that have, sorry, bind against namespaces that have the label environment prod. So effectively only applying it in our prod environment. So this is what it would look like. So here on the left, uh, left I'm trying to apply a, a, an Nginx deployment using the latest version of the Nginx image which we don't want to do. Uh, and as you can see here, kubectl apply, and we then get an error message. And the underlined here is our user-friendly error message from earlier. If I hadn't provided this, this is going to be like this big with our cell expression shown and very confusing as to what's gone on. So we've blocked latest image tag within our cluster, nice and easy, not reliant on any external services, no worries about network going down, pods restarting, as long as our API server is running, which it has to be to do an API call, our validation can be applied. Very good, nice and safe. So let's have a look at some of the more advanced features that this is, that, that this can, can support. Um, the example I showed was pretty minimal in terms of what it can do. There is quite a bit more. So there are more context, vari context values that we can use. So I already shown you the object that is uh, the, a the reference to the object of the API request. You've also got available uh, old object, which if this is a patch or an update or a delete operation, refers to whatever the previous version of the resource was. 
so you can compare what it was versus what you're trying to apply. And you've also got a request, which gives you some more information about who is making the API call. So for example, I may want to have a policy that only gets applied to people, to real users, to humans. The Kubelet gets an exception. Kubelet can do whatever it wants. I don't care about that. It can do whatever it wants. So in this example, I've got a match condition here where I say I want to exclude Kubelet requests. So the Kubelet I know is in the, sorry, I know has the user, user info groups system nodes. So I want to match against if it's not system nodes, the policy applies, whereas if it does have system nodes, i.e. Kubler in this case, um, ignore it. Doesn't, the policy doesn't apply to them. We've also got parameters. So one of the nice things about having the policy and the binding means that we can have a generic policy but have dynamic bindings in terms of how it's applied. So different namespaces could potentially have different variations of the policy applied to it. So we have this concept of parameters. On our validating admission policy, we defined a param kind, and we give it uh, the API version and kind of a CRD within our cluster. This can be whatever we want. In this example, it, as you can see, it's just an example on rules.example.com, and it's a replica limit, which is what I've got here. This is a CRD that we've created. And then we can use that parameter in our cell expression through the params property that we get available. So in this example, I want to make sure that uh, the number of replicas is less than or equal to the max replicas as defined in my parameter. Now, how we then end up using that is in our policy binding. When we are binding to that policy, we give it a param ref, which tells it what custom resource to go and apply to get those parameters from. In this example, my parameters in the default namespace. And the parameters itself just look something like this. Nice, simple resource that just has a property max, max replicas, and in this example, it's three. So my policy will say that the replicas has to have less than or equal to three. Now, in a different namespace, that could be 30, and a different policy binding could then use, use that with a different value. But the policy can be shared across all of them. We've also got variables, not to be confused with parameters. Variables are defined on the policy and are ways to make reusable bits of cell expression. So as I said, cell is, is designed to be quite a short language, ideally, um, but it's very easy for these to get very long very quickly, and you don't want a very long expression within your nice, tidy YAML. So you can make use of variables, uh, which can then be referenced within your expression to uh, simplify things. So in this example, I'm defining a variable called team label which will, if found, use a value from a label on the object and otherwise default to no team. And then I can use that within my expression as variables.teamLabel. Now, one thing to be aware of here is that the name of the variables has to be a cell valid name, not a Kubernetes valid name. So things with a hyphen in them will fail whereas things with camel casing like we've got here are OK. Uh, one thing just to be aware of, because that's caught me out in the past. Another thing we could do is audit annotations. So as I said, um, one of the things that policies can do is provide additional data into your audit log, so you can make sure that your validations are being audited when they fail and stuff. You can use audit annotations to add additional metadata to your audit log, not just that the request was passed or failed, but you can add um, expressions using cell again to add more values, more data to the metadata that is shown in your audit log. In this example, um, we are using the actual number of replicas that was trying to be used and having that available in the metadata of our annotation, uh, in our audit um, entry. You can have this as, as whatever you want, obviously. And finally, uh, message expressions. So as you saw earlier, we use message just to give a nice human readable message to the user when something goes wrong. Alternatively to that, you can use message expression, which is a cell expression that you can use to create the message that gets shown. This is useful, especially when using things like parameters, where you may want to show a more dynamic 
message to the user for when something goes wrong. For example, you can let them know that the max number of replicas is you know, params, not max replicas, rather than just saying, your deployment needs to be below the max replicas. And they're like, what is the max replicas? So it's very, very useful in that case. So, how are we doing? That's validation covered. What about mutating, which is where a lot of the nice use cases we saw earlier with webhooks come from? Well, let me introduce you to KEP3962 for mutating admission policies. As of right now, there is no version of Kubernetes that has this available. It is in the theoretical stage, let's say, at the moment. There is a PR open to add this implementation, but it didn't meet in time for the 130 code freeze, so it is likely going to be alpha version 131, which should be the first version where we can try this out. The general idea behind this is uh, it's the same idea as validating emission policies. So um, it will run in the API server. It will be created using resources within your cluster, but it will be able to perform mutating actions on your API request. And similarly, it introduces two resources, a mutating emission policy and a mutating emission policy binding, and supports two patch strategies, apply configuration and JSON patch, whichever makes most sense in your scenario. For phase one of uh, the release of uh, mutating emission policies, it will only support adding and updating of values. They are planning for phase two to also uh, allow unsetting, removing of values, but cell itself doesn't actually support that in the language. So they're trying to get a bit creative in, in how they're going to actually do that. It may be that some functionality is tried to introduce upstream to sell. They may kind of piggyback on a non-used function and this kind of thing. So it's, it's unclear at the moment. But right now, it's going to be you can add data or you can change data, but you can't remove data as part of these. Um, and as I said, it's not yet finalized or available for testing. So a quick example, it looks very similar to what we've already seen. Um, We've got the same sort of match constraints. So in this example, we are looking at when pods are created in our cluster, so any new ones. The example that I'm showing you here, what we're going to do is we're going to inject proxy environment variables into all containers within our cluster. So they, in an air-gapped environment, for example, uh, in a private, private cluster, we can make sure that all of our containers know where the proxy lives so that they can get out to the internet without us having to tell all of the deployment teams, you need to include this in your YAML. So we've also replaced validations with mutations, which makes sense. We use the patch type, like I said earlier. There's two options, apply configuration or JSON patch. This is exactly the same as what uh, Kube Control will use when you do a, a server-side apply, so it's, it's whichever one. And then we look at the mutation. So some of it new here is we've got this introduction of named types. So this is a cell feature that allows you to have types within your expression. Um, as of right now, it's currently unclear whether this capital O object is going to remain or whether it might change to something more like v1.pod.spec rather than this. Um, but for now, this is, this is what's in the kep, so I'm going to keep with this. But this just says this is the resource, this is the object that I'm going to apply. And the object here refers to whatever the type of the incoming object was. In this example, it's pods, because that's what we're, we're matching against. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, so on that, we've then got, pot, we've got spec, so object.spec, uh, and then containers within that, which is where we then want to make our mutation. So in our object, we have then, for every container, we want to uh, inject these uh, environment variables. So we're saying here, we've got the name and the value, so HTTP proxy, and then proxy.proxy.service, whatever. And we're going to append that to the rest of our environments within the containers. And obviously, we, if I have more space, in it containers and ephemeral containers will also be shown here. Policy binding, pretty much exactly the same thing. All that's different here is we don't have validation actions because it's not a validation. Um, but we reference the policy name, and we have match resources. So mutations hopefully coming in 131. 
Additional releases, we'll hopefully see that fleshed out much more. What might the future beyond that look like? So what, basically, what is my wish list for the future? None of this is set in stone, none of this is concrete, this is all theoretical at this point, but things that I can see coming are generative policies, so being able to create new resources based on API requests. So tools such as Caverno, for example, already have this functionality through webhooks. They can create a brand new resource based on a particular API call coming in. Um, resource lookup. So we've got parameters where we can kind of define this is a specific uh, resource that we want to be able to get values from. But sometimes you may want to look at the status of another resource, for example, and use that as part of your mutation or whatever. I can see that as being something that comes in the future. Um, something I know a lot of security teams are interested in is policy exceptions. So none of this, the, none of the validation or mutation or, or anything around that yet has any concept of being able to create exceptions to policies other than building those into the initial policy binding and stuff, which gets quite complex quite quickly. The abstraction tools such as Caverno and OV, OPA and stuff um, already has this sort of concept of uh, a, an exception resource that can, can tell you against that. Hopefully, that's going to come in the future. Um, and then I can also see quite a lot of abstractions coming. So Caverno, I know, are already working on abstractions on top of um, validating emission policies. And I can see additional uh, tools and stuff coming later that will also add, add additional niceties and, and user-friendly stuff on top. So in summary, um, I think it's time that we all start replacing some of those risky webhooks with in-process uh, policies where possible. Um, if we can get away with running more pods in our clusters and rely on the API server to do the work for us, all good. More resources for us to use for other things. Uh, as I said, uh, VPA, uh, sorry, VAP will be generally available in 1.30 for you to start using. If you want to use it today, use those feature flags. Uh, keep an eye on KEP3962 for mutation admission policies. I think we're going to see it as an alpha release in 1.31, uh, but not sure as of yet, PR still open. And I think we're going to get more of these abstractions and generative policies and stuff in the future. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. If you want any links to the resources and the slides and stuff, it's all there. Get in touch with me. Ask me questions later in the day, whatever, uh, whatever you'd like. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Come on. I have a question, but I wait for the, so. Hi, thanks for this talk. Uh, super great presentation. Um, with regards to, there was some, some talks about stale reads in, in Kubernetes. Uh, what, sorry? There was some, some talks about stale reads uh, some time ago. And do you know if the, the old object coming in, is it served from cache or from a actual consistent read? It just got me thinking when you... I think it's from consistent read, but I'm not entirely sure. It's server-side, so I would hope it was consistent read. Uh, I don't think it's from the cache, but I mm. don't know for certain. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Just got me. I would hope it's not from the cache, because that's not entirely useful in all circumstances. Any more questions? James? In your very first example that you showed, you were doing operations on, it was right at the beginning, um, you were doing operations on create and update. Mm -hmm. Does that mean it would miss patch? Yeah, good catch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I didn't know if patch was rolled in to update in this context or something. It's whatever the API server classes it as, and I can't remember. Anybody know? Patch is Patch different. I know it is from the client side, but I can't remember whether the API server bundles it as an update. Yeah. But, okay, cool. Maybe then. Maybe. Mm -hmm. We'll find out. Eh, I, I don't care. If people want to use Patch, then they can bypass it, right? Whatever. <laughs> okay, one question for yeah. me. How is your opinion with the uh, mutating and the generative hooks in the future? in terms of GitOps? So do you think um, it's going to be? I don't think it's going to be any different than today. We've already, we already see this logic with mutating webhooks. Like there's plenty running in clusters everywhere that, that, that do this sort of thing. 
most of the time you'll see these, uh, like a lot of defaulting logic, right? Things that you, we, we saw some talks earlier, you don't want to define everything in your YAML, like you don't want to define every single spec in your pod. Some of that stuff you just want cluster to deal with, right? The example of the, the HTTP proxy um, environment variables, like I don't want every single team within my organization to have to know that and have to update that if it changes. If I can do that at the cluster level, that's all good. Most GitOps tools allow for that kind of merge effect, and if not, there are options where you can kind of say ignore this value. Um, but as we've already got it today, I can't see it being a huge problem. So no danger for split brain because people can do this currently also. I mean, there is a potential danger, but no more than today. Okay, okay. Then if there's, oh yeah, another question. Good, good. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. but that, that um, got me thinking, is there anything like the storage version migrator that if you apply a new policy, mm -hmm. then it takes all of those deployments, daemon sets, stateful sets, and runs it through the mutating one or yes. the validating one to actually check that? Yes, so thing. Um, with both the uh, admission webhooks and the admission policies, there is an mm -hmm. order that they go mm -hmm. through that the API server, for every single API request, goes through these. First, it does. Let me get this right. I think it's first it's validating admission policies, and it iterates through all of those. Then it does the validating admission webhooks, iterates through all of those. Then it does CRD validation, if needed. Then it does the mutating ones. If the mutating changes anything, it goes back and runs through again. But, but I meant the stuff that it's an it's NetCD already. It's the final value that comes out of the end of that pipe. Yeah, yes, but uh, so say, say that you have some really bad data and then you add a new, this latest tag, for example, but you already have lots of... Oh, it, sorry, it doesn't, it doesn't retroactively right, apply, right, no. But there's it's, no. It's based on API requests. Right, but there's nothing that actually pokes those resources. No. No. Okay. no. Something for the future. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> First, you jump to him, and second, he cannot film you anymore, so... Okay, um, any further questions? I like to wonder. Just look out for Marcus, and thanks again for the nice talk. And Thank you.